Listen up, listen up, fellow Democrats. Fight fake news and lies with facts. Save our democracy from right-wing hypocrisy. Keep our integrity, embrace our diversity. Whenever we're down, we always come back. So listen up, listen up, Democrats. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Progressive Oregon, a weekly engagement uh, broadcast on progressive issues in Oregon. My name is Larry Taylor and I'm your host. Uh, today uh, on our agenda we have a weekly update uh, and then our main program is the second part of our Roberts Rules uh, Survival Guide for Burners. Uh, and the topics we'll be going through today are uh, the role of the chair, appealing a ruling of the chair, and voting within democratic assemblies. And then we'll be talking about uh, upcoming events and throughout that, we can be taking questions from the audience. So the, um, the Democratic Party has an opportunity to open up the primary uh, to non-affiliated voters this coming year. Uh, the last opportunity to vote on that will be the uh, November 19th State Central Committee meeting. Um, uh, the bylaws allows the party to open it up and they have to vote it on each time. Uh, and it has to pass by a two-thirds vote, which um, is a fairly fairly high threshold to achieve. So why is this important and why is this election different? Um, Oregon's motor voter law has significantly increased the number of non-affiliated voters in Oregon. Uh, if you can see on the chart, um, pretty much steady uh, non-affiliated voter registration with a couple of bumps between uh, 2007 and 2016 and then 2016, there was a huge jump and then another significant jump in 2017, which still has another two and a half months to go. So that number is gonna get even greater. Uh, if you go to uh, the next slide, uh, why is this important? So the motor voter law went into effect on January 1st, 2016. And what this chart illustrates is the difference between the, 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 the year and the previous year's registration. Uh, and you can see in 2016, that was the first year of motor voter, uh, there was almost 200,000 uh, people registered and there's still a significant amount that was registered in um, 2017. Um, and then if you go to the slide on uh, change in registration, registration from 2010 to 2017, you can see the, the change in registration on Democrats, Republicans and non-affiliated voters. There was a slight increase in Democrats, a slight increase in, in the Republicans, but a huge leap in the number of non-affiliated voters. And it's not because they don't care. Um, and uh, as you can see, uh, the total of non-affiliated voters is uh, just under 800,000 at this point. And if they vote, um, they could determine who wins the 2018 governor's race. And so we are encouraging the governor's campaign staff to really help us convince the Democratic Party that they need to do this. Um, so why are there so many non-affiliated voters? Well, um, the law uh, registers people when they go to the Division of Motor Vehicles, which is why it's called Motor Voter. Um, so they're automatically registered unless they opt out. And then 30 days after they, they, they are registered, they get a postcard from the Secretary of State and it says, would you like to be affiliated with a political party? And they list the 12 political parties and they have to do, they have to be proactive. They have to return the card or they have to go online and change their voter registration or they have to do something that's proactive to change that. And you know, politics is not centered to many people's lives and, and many of them just don't get around to doing that. Um, and then many people don't realize that if they're not a member of the Republican or the Democratic Party, they are not, they generally can't participate in the primaries. And we have the big primary coming up in 2018. So uh, when they get their ballots in, 28, in the primary of 2018, and if the parties do not open up the, uh, the voting to non-affiliated voters, then they just get to vote on any ballot measure and any nonpartisan position that happens to be in their ballot. Um, and so they end up with a very slim ballot and statistically not very many of them vote. And so some people use this as an argument for why bother opening them up. But um, uh, we believe that if the Democratic Party would just open up and, and be more welcoming to these people uh, and have a conversation with them, 
uh, and demonstrate to the ones that are aligned with the Democratic Party politically and their values, they would they would make the switch to the Democratic Party. Um, if they uh, if they don't get involved and don't vote, um, uh, we could be heading towards an election that looked a lot like 2016 because there's um, a lot of people who are not enthusiastic about the ticket as it's currently lining up. So what can you do about it? Um, the decision to open up the primary in the Democratic Party will be made by uh, 169 or or slightly less delegates who show up at the meeting on November 19th. These are the delegates that are elected from your county to represent your party in the in the Democratic Party of Oregon. Um, you need to find out who the delegates are who represent you and have a conversation with them uh, and tell them that you would like them to uh, to vote for this if, if that's what you would like. They will probably be shocked because no one ever uses their representatives to the party for anything, but that's what they are there for. They're elected to represent you. Um, generally, it's very hard to find out who they are. You might have to uh, call up the county chair and find out who they who they are or attend the meeting of the, your county Democrats. Uh, and they should be in attendance. And if they aren't, you can find out who they are and, and call them up. I would also have a chat with your county chair and let them know that this is an issue important to you. Um, and then you might also consider contacting the officers of the Democratic Party of Oregon. Uh, the website of the Democratic Party of Oregon is www.dpo.org. And you can talk, to, you can call up Gene Atkins, the chair, uh, Valdez Bravo and Lupita Maurer, the vice chairs. Um, or any of the other officers, you also have three DNC members um, that will that also have a vote in this election. And so I encourage you to uh, to uh, contact them as well. Uh, and then if you are under the age of, I don't know, 50 or so and are tech savvy, you could consider uh, running a social media campaign. Most of the county parties have Facebook uh uh, pages and you can go on and do your postings on there uh, and start the discussion and, 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 and help us make sure that this gets passed. Other news this week. Um, so Governor Kate Brown, it is alleged, is to name Senators uh, Richard Devlin and Ted Ferrioli to the Northwest Power and, and Conservation Council. Um, uh, this was news that just broke uh, like in the last few days, and it's amazing how much uh, has happened since then, since nothing is even official or announced. Um, so what does this mean? So it means that the senators will probably resign before their term ends, and the appointment process gets triggered similar to what we saw for House District 38. And uh, for those of you who didn't watch that, the process is, is, the, is that the precinct committee people who reside in their districts will pick between three and five um, nominees to replace them. And then the county commissioners who have counties within these districts will get together and choose from the nominated candidates uh, the final winner. Um, this, this allows uh, two different scenarios. So probably the most interesting is Ted Ferrioli's because he has, is the second longest serving legislator in Salem. Um, and uh, so for him to leave opens up a, a huge spot that has not been available for people to run for for many, many years. It's the largest uh, Senate district in Oregon. It, um, uh, what it means for Democrats is that, um, you know, the typical scenario is that the, the House representative for the two house, seat, house seats that comprise that Senate district, uh, usually one of the, usually they vie for the nomination and one of them gets picked uh, because it's, everyone likes to be in the Senate. There's, there's fewer senators and the terms are longer and you don't have to run a campaign every two years. Um, and so it could open, so if one of the two sitting um, uh, representatives uh, gets moved up, it, it means that there, there will be a replacement for that representative and they will run uh, uh, for the seat in next year, but they will not be really an incumbent because they haven't uh, run before. So it's possible that the Democrats could find a candidate and, and win an election in the eastern part of the state for the first time in years. 
Um, uh, so in House District uh, 59, that uh, includes Wasco County, Jefferson County, Wheeler County, and a corner of Deschutes County. And then if the, uh, the, the representative from House District 60 uh, gets chosen, that is Grant County, Baker County, Harney, Malheur, and a corner of Lake County. Um, the district is huge. Um, and it, it's the kind of county that's very hard to, to campaign in because the distances are so great. Uh, but there's an opportunity possibly for Democrats there. In uh, Senate District 19, which is where uh, uh, Richard Devlin is, um, that's in the um, uh, the Lake Oswego Westland area. Um, and so the precinct committee persons from Clackamas, Multnomah, and Washington County will again pick three nominees to, re to replace Richard Devlin. Um, and then the county commissioners from those three counties will get together. Um, uh, and last time when this was done for to replace Ann Linegar, it was the 10 commissioners from uh, Multnomah and Clackamas. This time they will include the commissioners from Washington County. So lo logical successors um, in, in the metro area would be the Democrats in those two House District races. But it turns out that House District 37 is, is held by Julie Parrish, who is a Republican, so she won't be selected. The other House District is 38, where we just um, had uh, Andrea Salinas nominated to um, to uh, to occupy, and um, uh, it would be awkward for her to then uh, jump to the Senate. And we've heard that she's said that she has no intention of doing so. What's most interesting is that the rumors out there that the the establishment has has picked Greg McPherson to run for this seat. Um, uh, Greg has a long history uh, in the Oregon legislature, and he's actually held uh, House District 38 previously, um, and so he would he would uh, he would join the legislature with with a lot of uh, immediate seniority. But then, you know, once again, it doesn't seem very democratic to have the the establishment picking a candidate and all of this laid out in advance of them doing the nomination. Um, so, what can you do? Um, if you are a Democrat in Senate District 19, uh, you can apply to be appointed as a precinct committee person for your county. Um, so you would have to reside in the corners of your county that uh, that are in uh, Senate District 19. And if you're appointed, then you're eligible to, to participate in the nominating convention. Uh, it would be really, you know, uh, as, as we've talked about previously, the nominating conventions are, are just one of the purest forms of democracy and it's, uh, they're really fun events, and uh, I, I think you'll enjoy it. So, uh, if you need more information, you can you can contact us, and we would help you through that process. Is there any questions on the line, Betsy? Yes, actually, there was one. Can the DNC possibly go any lower? Uh, and it was. Um, metalhead and asking about the purging process that went on uh this week in the dnc well that's a different topic <laughs> um uh for those of you who are watching what happened in, in las vegas so the democratic national committee met in las vegas this past week for their uh, biannual meeting and uh just before the meeting convened uh they replaced a number of people on the uh in the leadership um uh, and the, the, the newspaper articles characterized them as being supporters of the opponents of Tom Perez, and it looked like he was sort of cleaning house and consolidating power. Um, I know three of the four people that were, um, that were mentioned in the article, and you know they had been around for a long time, and it's always good to re rotate leadership. So I wasn't so concerned about them. What I found more concerning was the report that um, the rules committee is still stacked with uh, Hillary supporters and they control the rules of the upcoming convention. And so um, uh, what they really need to do is change the rules so the Democratic Party is more democratic and less autocratic. And it needs to be more participatory so that when the Democratic National Committee delegates go to these meetings, they actually do something other than sit through uh, lectures and training sessions. Um, Thank so you. that's that. Anything I, else, Betsy? Oh, John. Yeah. yeah, I have a question. 
that kind of ties the two together because I think what a lot of people are saying is, all right, so here they go again, you know, rigging things and, and making it impossible for democracy to function in a lot of people's views. Why even bother with it? This stuff you're talking about, voting, being able to vote for different people, commissioners getting together, how to, you know, at what point do we get to control those strings and what kind of strings are we pulling down here at the local level that we can assure that, you know, our elections aren't rigged, right? So uh, it, it's been a common theme that we've talked about in these sessions all along. The Democratic Party has been run as a priesthood, uh, both at the national level and at the state level. And uh, a lot of rank and file Democrats just don't participate. They've never been asked to. They don't know how to get in. It was just by chance that I learned how, about becoming a precinct committee person 21 years ago at a completely unrelated meeting. Uh, so I would really like to see more Democrats get involved with the party and hold the leadership accountable. Um, it's when we have fewer people participating that we start getting these these things that, that you know, even if they are not evil, they have the appearance of evil. Like uh, the, the previous nomination convention, uh, we had the accelerated schedule that just felt like uh, they were racing through it and preventing new people from getting involved in the process. Uh, what we need is more people to hold the party accountable and tell them that they have to stop this. And that's done by participating and electing commissioners that are in pieces of shit. Is that what I'm getting? That and uh, dem you know, uh, democratic officials. You know, we had the reorganization in March. Uh, you need to elect uh, officers who will conduct themselves with uncompromising integrity. And then eventually those officers end up in higher positions of power like Tom Perez, right? I mean, that's really yes. what we're end up growing here is our own wing of the Democratic Party by doing yes. All right. Just thanks. Didn't mean to butt in. <laughs> Any other questions, Betsy? Yeah. Jeffrey Pearson asked, uh, what would disqualify a PCP from being appointed? Uh, each each county um, has their own rules. Um and they vary all over the place. Um, it, it gets it goes down to uh, getting a majority vote when you are when you're uh, when your nomination is up for a vote. Um, and it has happened that that well-intended people uh, have been prevented from becoming a PCP because the people in power didn't like their politics. This is something else that we're uh, working to clean up. Never before have we ever denied a a well-intended Democrat from participating in the Democratic Party of Oregon. And the behavior we've seen over the past year has been just unprecedented in, uh, in what we've seen. Um, so what, we what you really need to do is register to become elected because it is nearly impossible to remove an elected precinct committee person. Um, and if you go to P our website, pdpo.org, you can register and we will make sure that you are uh, uh, informed of the process when it comes up and uh, and meet the deadlines and get registered to run. That's something I have to do. I've just been appointed, not elected. So I have to go get that locked in. Yeah, you get superpowers when you're elected. All right, then I get to actually <laughs> vote for the chairs and other people and things. And if they turn out to be jerks, I can vote them out. That's That's where it starts with the power right there. If Larry turns out to be some maniacal crazy guy, you know, no, just kidding. That's right. Anything else on the line, Betsy? Um, Michael Stapleton said, what is the purity test? I asked. For <laughs> well, it, again, it varies. Um, uh, so, it, you know, hopefully they, they are judging by things that are measurable. So there are counties that have rules like you have to attend three uh, county meetings uh, before you can be appointed. Uh, there's others that uh, you have to meet with the district leader and I, I don't know, uh, pass their sniff test or whatever they do. Um, you know, anyone who is denied um, should should really raise a uh, uh, fit. Uh, the, the only reason someone should not be appointed is because there is not an available precinct committee person slot available to them. Uh, and you can run for, and you can be appointed to a slot in the precinct in which you live or in a precinct that's adjacent to the one that you live in. And in most counties, there's a lot of empty precinct committee person slots. Yes. 
Anything else? Uh, I think that's all the questions. Okay. Well, then we're going to move on to part two of our uh, survival guide for burners. Um, uh, so the first uh, section is uh, uh, about the role of a chair in a democratically run organization. So uh, I, I, the, the, the concept of a leader is, is, has been really interesting. And I used to think that the terms for the leadership was synonymous, but it turns out that there's a real distinction between uh, what these, these roles imply. Um, so, you know, and you see in nonprofit organizations, uh, they get uh, they get a president of the board, and they have an executive director. <coughs> Excuse me. And these are, you know, they 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 tend to be mission based organizations, and uh, and so you you hire your executive director or your, you elect your your president because of his vision, and 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 what they want to implement. And the actual definition of a president is the chief officer of an organization, usually entrusted with the direction and administration of the policies. Um, but democratic assemblies are a little bit different. Um, and, uh, and what you have in them is a presiding officer uh, that is often, that is referred to as the chair. Uh, and in democratic ex assemblies, the nature of their job is bottoms up. Um, because the those kinds of organizations are are really based on the will of the assembly, and this is where you you get the concept of the supreme power being you know the majority of the the people. So in Robert's Rules of Order, they lay out the qualifications for a chair. The first one is that they should be well versed in parliamentary procedure and thoroughly familiar with the bylaws and rules of the organization. Uh, and the reason why they need to be well versed in parliamentary procedures because they have to understand the nature of democracy. Um, they should expedite business in every way compatible with the rights of the members. So they have to have an understanding of what the rights of the members are so that they can protect them. Um, the impartiality required of the chair precludes their participation in the debate while presiding. And to participate in the debate, the, the chair should relinquish their the chairmanship and turn the meeting over to the highest ranking officer who has not spoken on the topic. Um, and again, this is, all goes back to them administering the organization in a democratic manner. The chair is impartial. Um, and they need to take special care to make sure that members always understand what the immediate pending business is. So if you're if you're, you're coming up to a vote and the vote is like the reverse of how you would logically think about something, they need to, it needs to be explained to them what the meaning of a yes vote or a, a no vote means. Um, the role of the chair is to carry out the will of the assembly because in a democracy, the supreme power resides with the, with the people. So uh, you've probably seen these behaviors in, in alleged democratic meetings where they the chair thinks that they're more out there more authoritarian than, than they have powers granted to them. Uh, but the chair cannot adjourn meetings. Uh, the assembly decides when the meeting is adjourned. Uh, the meeting is not adjourned when the room reservation ends. It's when the assembly is finished deliberating. Um, and it goes also to the agenda. So if, if, the, if the assembly wants to spend the entire time playing bingo, then that's the will of the assembly and the chair has to follow that. Uh, the chair cannot vote except when the voting is done by secret ballot um, or there is a tie. So if you see a chair uh, trying to vote, uh, uh, when a vote is being taken uh, by raising hands, uh, you, sh you should call out point of order, chair does not vote. Um, and the chair cannot engage in the debate in order to remain impartial. Um, so. A lot of chairs think that they are essential to the functioning of the organization, but the reality is, is that the elected chair uh, is not essential to the conducting of the meeting um, unless the bylaws specifically state that the chair has to be there. Uh, the meeting can go forward if uh, the quorum is achieved and proper notice has been given. Uh, I've seen bylaws where they have they state that so many of the officers have to be present. Um, but it's, they usually don't state that a chair has to be there because you have to have some flexibility for the chair to like be on vacation or something. 
Um, the chair cannot impose their own agenda on the meeting. Uh, the, gen the agenda is specified in the bylaws uh, or it defaults to the agenda that is laid out in Robert's Rules of Order. Um, so uh, they can't show up with something that they they pulled out of thin air. And this is for the, you know, the, the regular meetings. Uh, there's a slightly different set of rules for committees and boards. Um, the chair must keep the meeting on track. Um, so if uh, the meeting is on topic A and uh, people start debating a separate parallel topic, uh, you do not have to sit there and listen to them. You can, you can remind the chair that, that there, there's an agenda to be followed and you just say point of order, uh, I, I, uh, I, I move the agenda or, or more simply it's like, you know, we need to get back to the agenda and they should do that. Uh, the chair cannot arbitrarily ignore members wishing to be recognized. Um, just because someone is asking a lot of questions and is being uh, uh, a pain doesn't mean that the chair uh, can ignore them. The chair is responsible for ensuring that everyone in the room gets heard and that people who have not spoken get an opportunity to, but they can't ignore uh, uh, a legitimate member of the assembly. And they are in. They are responsible to ensure that the will of the majority is followed during voting. So the bylaws define the powers of the chair, and the powers that are not defined by the governing documents to those listed in Robert's Rules of Order, and there is nothing else that they can do legitimately, except get away with things um, that the assembly allows them to. Is there any questions on that section, Betsy? No. Okay. Um, uh, the next section is the, the most dramatic thing I've come across in Robert's Rules of Order, and I was astonished when I found it. Um, it's, uh, it's a process called appealing a decision of the chair, and um, it's, it's the one part of Robert's Rules of Order that really brought home to me the, the, the whole uh, democracy-centered aspect of it. So uh, appealing the ruling of the chair is on pages 255 through 260 of Robert Schultz of Order, if you'd like to read through that. Um, so if you have a chair um, that, and the meeting's going along and, uh, uh, and they make a ruling and the ruling could be anything, um, you can uh, appeal the ruling of the chair. And what this process does is, is that it uh, takes the the decision out of the chair's hands and it moves it to the assembly. Uh, sometimes the bylaws are not um, written as clearly as, as we hope and there's room for interpretation. And so if you have a chair that is interpreting the bylaws in a way that the, the majority doesn't agree with, this is the process that you would follow to, um, uh, to get that corrected. So any two members have the right to appeal the decision of the chair it can be applied to any ruling of the presiding chair or the presiding officer. It is an order when another has the floor, so you don't have to wait to be um, uh, recognized, uh, but the appeal must be made at the time of the ruling. So if the chair makes a ruling, then you have to say, I appeal from the decision of the chair. It must be seconded. So two people have to have to think that the, um, uh, the chair's ruling is, is incorrect. Um, this is debatable. So um, the rules governing this, this process is that no member may speak more than once and the chair gets to speak first and then the chair gets to speak at the end uh, explaining why they ruled the way they did. And a majority um, or a tie vote sustains the decision of the chair. Um, so one of the interesting things in here um, is that chairs shouldn't feel offended if if they've had their their ruling appealed uh, a presiding officer should welcome this kind of uh, process because they might have had some doubt about their ruling and you know they hopefully they want to do the right thing and so what this does is transfer the decision of the ruling to the body uh, and so the majority of the people have to be in agreement with the, with the ruling itself Then there's another area that's related to this, which is enforcing points of order and appeals. So um, if you have a chair that acts improperly, 
like fails to recognize a member or ignore, ignores a properly made motion, a point of order may be raised and from a chair's decision an appeal may be taken. This procedure enables a majority to ensure the enforcement of the rules. Uh, if the chair ignores the point of order, the member can repeat the point of order a second and third time, and if the chair stills ignore it, the member standing in their place can immediately put the point of order to a vote without debate, similarly handled when chairs ignore appeals. Uh, the member can, standing in place, put the appeal to a vote without debate. The question may be put as, shall the decision of the chair be sustained? So. This is a, the rare instance where you have a chair that is behaving badly and uh, Robert's Rules uh, uh, transfers the power of, of controlling this aspect of the meeting to, to a member. Um, and to remove a presiding officer, if, if the chair fails to act in accordance with the assembly's decision or otherwise fail to perform the duties of the chair properly, the assembly may temporarily replace the chair. A motion to suspend the rules may be passed to remove the chair for the balance of the meeting. So if you have a chair that is being especially egregious, you do not have to put up with it if a majority agrees. And there's a process in Robert's rules for doing this. As you can imagine, this would be uh, a gutsy thing to do. Um, but, you know, in meetings, you can get a sense of, of uh, how things are going. Uh, and if the, the chair is is actually following the will of the, the group or is, is going off in a different direction. Is there any questions on the line, Betsy? No, no questions. Everyone's in stunned silence. <laughs> yes, you have the power uh, and the supreme power lies with the assembly. Um, I have a, I have a question, just real quick yes, on John. this. If, if we had known this stuff at the, the, the meeting with Roberta, would, would it, when we had Roberta's rules, would we have been able to stop her or was she in line and able to just smack the gavel down and get out? Uh, you know, that, that's a tough one. Uh, you would really have to act your, have, have your act together. But yes, uh, she would not have been able to get rid of that. And I, I assume you're talking about Roberta in Nevada. Yes, I am. Yeah. Mm. So uh, it's, it's harder in conventions because you literally have hundreds and hundreds of people uh, but if someone was up on the rules and was watching for this, uh, they could have raised a point of order. And even though she stormed out of the room, uh, the next, uh, the next uh, ranking officer should be put in her place to continue the meeting. Wow. Yeah, the chair can't gavel meetings closed like that. Wow. Well, there we go. This happened in, this happened in Oregon when uh, 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 Ailey, I think his name was, or uh, Ali, um, uh, he was the high tech guy who was chair of the Republican Party, and this was back in the days when the uh, Tea Party was in an in insurgency, and uh, the Tea Party was getting too many delegates at their nominating convention here in Oregon, and he gaveled the convention closed and walked out, um, and and they let him. Wow, thank you know, is there enough of this going on that we could do a series? Chairs gone wild or something? <laughs> Chairs, you know. That would be a great collection of, uh, of videos, and they're probably all getting filmed at this day and age. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> all right, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else, Betsy? Okay. Uh, the third seg segment. Oh, go ahead, John. No, no I just wanted to re uh, re say hi to Marsha, who's here from uh, rural. Where are you from, Marsha? I saw you. Marsha Stewart's here from rural Oregon progressives. Getting organized here at Rural Oregon Progressives. This is extremely helpful, she says. So thank you very much, Marsha. Glad you're here. We love Marsha. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so the, uh, the, the third section is on voting in meetings. Um, so if you're in a democratically um, organized meeting and you, you keep attending and you find yourself sitting there with, without ever voting on anything, then there's probably something wrong. Uh, because there should be things put to you frequently so that 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 the will of the assembly is is being carried out um, unless you have made the mistake of transferring all of your power to the executive committee or to the chair itself so that there's no decisions left for you to be made um, uh, you should be involved in the decision making and that's how you end up with a happy 
happy assembly is because you do not have a a um, a division between what the leadership is doing and what the assembly wants to be done. So, so periodically you have the opportunity to vote, and in general the votes are uh, are, are done by vo voice vote. And you know we've all seen this happen, right? The, all those in favor of the motion to blah 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 say aye, and um, all those opposed say no. And the uh, the uh, chair makes a determination on uh, whether it, the motion passes or not, and then they announce the results, and then they move on. However, sometimes it is not clear um, uh, if 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 the the ruling was correct or who or if you know or who the majority was. Um, and I also want to make the point that in general, it's a majority vote, but. Uh, there are certain votes like those anything that limits the rights of membership uh, it requires a two-thirds vote and a two-thirds vote is much more iffy to determine uh, if a lot of people are voting uh, in both directions um, so when there is any possibility of confusion the chair when calling the vote should make sure that the members understand the effect of a yes or a no vote um, and then if the voice vote is inconclusive you take what is known as a rising vote um, and that's where people stand. And so the chair should say, okay, I couldn't tell what was going on. So all those in favor of the motion to do blah, 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 please stand. Or, you know, if, if you, you can't stand, uh, they'll make accommodations for whatever it takes for you to cast your vote. And then they should, uh, the, those should, should sit that back down. And then all the people on the other side should have an opportunity to rise. And then Hopefully, it can visually be determined then uh, which side the majority voted on. Uh, but again, if it's a two-thirds vote, it might not be clear if there's a lot of people in the room. And um, and so then they they count the vote. Um, any member who doubts the judgment of the vote can call for a division of the assembly. Um, you don't want to do this if you are just being a pain in the butt. Uh, so if it if only one person voted and you call for a division, the chair can rule, rule you out of order and move on. So whenever a member doubts the result of a voice vote by a show of hands, they say, I, I call, they raise their hand, they recognize, and they say, I call for a division of the assembly. Um, this takes precedence over any motion. It is an order when another has the floor, uh, does not require a second, and it is not debatable, and it is not amendable. Uh, so it does not require, um, it doesn't require a second because since, uh, a single member can demand a division, this is one of the most uh, power th powerful things that an individual can do inside of a meeting if it's appropriate. The, the motion for a division of the assembly cannot be reconsidered. So you really can only do it once. Um, but you don't have, you know, by all means don't sit there and allow a, a vote that you think was improperly uh, counted stand. Um, so there's just one warning um, uh, when uh, assemblies get all, all comfy and friendly with each other. Um, this happened at the fateful meeting in August of 2016 uh, <coughs> when um, the uh, the chair of the rules committee at a state central committee meeting said um, uh, had a uh, had a bylaws change brought to the floor which could only be done by unanimous consent and because it was late in the day and it was hot in the room and everyone was tired and they'd been in the meeting for a long time everyone and they trusted the chair uh, implicitly they they let it go forward um, but you have to watch for this and you know if you start having twinges of doubt don't let it go forward. Um, so if everything is copacetic, the chair is allowed to expedite voting if it appears that the assembly is in agreement by using what is called unanimous consent. Um, and this is usually used for administrative actions like approval of the minutes. So, you know, if you've distributed the minutes and no one gave you any feedback, the chair uh, doesn't have to spend a lot of time on, on the, the minutes. You can, the chair can say, <coughs> um, uh, is there any any uh, any further comments on the minutes? And if no one speaks, then they can, you can just say, um, so uh, uh, with no objection, I'm going to assume that we approve the minutes by unanimous consent. And usually everyone is cool with that. 
um, if there is something egregious in the minutes, like it was, it didn't record something properly, then you need to step up and, and say so. Um, the magic words that they use to invoke this, if there is no objection, uh, uh, but this means that you have to speak up to hold it. So when they were doing the, the bylaws consideration, someone did ask a question but there there was a they were dis, they were dis, their their concern was dismissed and they didn't formally say i object uh which would have triggered um, a whole different process but you have to um, you have to watch out for this stuff because there are chairs who are very facile at the use of robert's rules of order and and they just lull you into accepting things that, that you you shouldn't be accepting and certainly if you do not understand uh, something that is new and being brought before the meeting that you feel like it's being ram, rammed through and you're not given appropriate time to consider it, uh, at the very least you should postpone a consideration of that item to the next meeting so you have time to look, look into the matter. <coughs> Are there any questions on that? No, no more questions, no questions. Either everyone's asleep or I'm very clear. <clears throat> so that's uh, that's our segments on uh, Robert's rules for today. Um, uh, we have some we have some very uh, exciting upcoming events. Um, the most exciting is that we're um, hosting a town hall for progressive democracy on November twenty sixth. Uh, it's going to be based in the Sunnyside Community House in the Belmont District of Portland. But we're going to, uh, through the miracle of the internet, we're going to be live streaming the event from the, from the facility. And what this means is that we can bring in speakers from anywhere in the world to speak to the group. And uh, anywhere, anyone in the world can watch the, uh, the, the event from the uh, comfort of their living room or wherever they are if they can't make it to Portland. Uh, the facility seats about 300 people um, and we expect it to be packed out. Um, uh, most exciting is that our keynote speaker is going to be Nina Turner. Um, so the event is on November 26th um, where the doors will open at one o'clock where we will have a room set up uh, for groups to do tabling. Uh, we'll be inviting all of our uh, cousin our revolution groups from across Oregon to the table. And we'll also be inviting the caucuses of the Democratic Party of Oregon to participate. Uh, at two o'clock, the, the uh, actual event will start uh, being live streamed and we'll have a number of speakers. Uh, what we want to do, this is the kickoff to uh, the, the 2018 election. And we want to make sure everyone is aware of the platform convention coming up and, and about the whole process to become PCPs and get everyone in, involved in the activities of the party. Uh, there's a second slide. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, you can attend in person or you can watch it live stream. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, admission is free, um, but we do give people the opportunity to contribute if they, if they would like to. John, would you like to add anything to the event? No, no, you, you covered all. That was great. Just, uh, I mean, and if anybody's out there who wants to know that you'll be doing the reorganization meeting as a separate live stream afterwards uh, as well. I don't know if that matters, but. Yes, and that's my next slide. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, John. That's preempting you. There you go. <laughs> um, so uh, the, every two years, the Progressive Caucus reorganizes and, and elects officers. Um, if, uh, if you would like to get involved in that process, um, uh, you, there's a tab on our homepage called Reorganization. Uh, we've listed all of the positions that are up for election. Uh, there's a number of uh, committee chairs uh, that, whose chair will be electing. Uh, there's five directors, well, actually six directors from the uh, five congressional districts, and then, of course, the officers of the organization. Um, and as John said, it'll be a separate uh, live stream show than the uh, the town hall. But we want all of our membership to be able to participate. And it's not fair to people who live in the far corners of the state to have to travel to Portland uh, to participate in this. And so we're 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 using the internet to uh, 
to allow them to watch all the speeches that will be happening, and then we'll be do, doing electronic voting afterwards um, that will determine the winners of the, the races. The other thing to be aware of is the 2018 platform convention, which is uh, coming up um, very, very soon. It's going to be March 17th and 18th. Uh, there's no details uh, that's been released yet on the location, but it's typically held in the Portland metro area somewhere. Um, uh, so you can come to the town hall and learn more about this. I'm also going to be doing a future program on the platform convention and the process for participating in that. And this is where the people um, of the Democratic Party of Oregon have the opportunity to, to get together and craft the platform of the Democratic Party of Oregon for the subsequent two years. Um, I always go into these weekends with enormous dread because it just feels like uh, a lot of stressful meetings, but I've always come out of the platform conventions uh, very encouraged because Democrats tend to uh, be in general agreement of a very progressive agenda and the discussions in these meetings are just around the, the details of the fringes of the issues. Um, I've always enjoyed them and I'm hoping that we get great attendance this year. Betsy, you wanted to announce um, what's going yeah. on in Douglas County. Yeah, but first, uh, Michael Stapleton said can, has a question. I think about the rules presentation. Can rules be ignored if voted on? And I think it's about they need to be enforced. Is there a way to enforce them? Uh, you can suspend. Um, you can spend, suspend standing rules, um, and that's why we like standing rules because they're procedural in nature, uh, and they are they're of, of uh, lesser um, importance than the bylaws. Uh, and you can suspend the rules, but you you cannot suspend the bylaws. So you have to follow the bylaws. Uh, and if you don't like the way the bylaws are written, you have then you should modify them, and that requires a two-thirds vote. But if you find uh, the laws the 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 rules being violated, you can you you know you say point of order. I believe the bylaws state that you know blah 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 blah, uh, and. Uh, you know, everyone should have a copy of their bylaws so that everyone can look and see the wording. Um, uh, and the chair has to follow them. If the chair does not follow them, then you have to follow the procedure we talked about earlier and get the chair removed. All right. So Douglas County, what is happening November 7th is election day here. We have a uh, 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 a measure, the only thing on the ballot in Douglas County is an attempt to change county government, the structure of county government. In Oregon, there's two ways for counties to organize. One is under more general authority of the state, uh, which is called general law, and the other is what is trying to happen here is called home rule charter, which is actually a provision in the Oregon Constitution and gives more local authority. Uh, in Douglas County, I would say that we have developed a good coalition of not only progressives but other people that don't like the status quo. Uh, there was a art, there was a story in OPB, Oregon Public Broadcasting did. Uh, I'll put a link to that but also if you're interested in this subject because only nine of the 36 counties uh, in, Doug in Oregon or are home rule right now. So maybe something other people want to consider if they're looking at doing some impact at a local level. Level. Um, so we'll put on the Facebook page for Progressive Oregon, we'll put a link to a, a forum that was just conducted this last week by the League of Women Voters that explains the difference between home rule charter and general law um, under for counties. So if you're in Douglas County, please vote. You know, the most progressives here, I would say, are voting yes, because for Douglas County, we have a... Uh, Red, we have a red county and very conservative folks who actually uh, reliance upon the timber industry has kind of um, driven our uh, county down. And um, so it's kind of shaking up the powers to be the good old boys network that exists in many rural counties in, in Oregon. Yes, home rule is a really interesting topic. Um, it doesn't the whether a county is home rule or not has nothing to do with the size. So um, I believe Multnomah County is home is a uh, home rule county, uh, That's right. which has a huge budget. And and my county here, Clatsop County, is also home rule. Um, 
uh, currently the the three commissioners in Douglas County get paid uh, what is it seventy eighty thousand bucks a piece uh, right. for their work and and they actually do the the work of the county and uh, the general belief is that um, uh, a more evolved model is that you have uh, especially for smaller counties is that you have a a larger board of uh, county commissioners. So my my board of commissioners here in Clatsop County has five members and the county is divided into five districts. And so every two years we elect either two or three uh, county commissioners. They are not paid. Uh, and But what they do do for managing the county is they hire a administrator. And then the, the county manager actually runs the county. Um, and that way you get a professionally run county and uh, you can you can do that with the, the smaller counties. Um, I, I don't know how they do it in Multnomah. It's, it's much more complex. There's pros and cons to it. I, I know our county commissioners uh, feel like second class citizens when they go to uh, some of the conferences because everyone else is in the, in the room from a regular county. Um, they're being paid to be there uh, where our county commissioners are not being paid to be there. Uh, but then they're also not under the influence of anyone because, um, you know, they're, the, 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 the races are much smaller and we don't see the kind of uh, money in the races that would really influence the outcome. There was one other thing I wanted to announce, and that is that we are having information sessions on running for office in, uh, in the Portland area uh, on tomorrow night on Monday, October 2nd our 22nd and on Wednesday, October 25th. So on Monday night, I will be at the Hillsboro Brookwood Library. Uh, doors open at 630 and uh, people can come and, and learn about the process for running for office. There's people who are interested in doing this, but they have no idea how to get started and, and who to talk to. Uh, what we can do is explain to you the process for running for office and what you need to do to get started. And, uh, you know, we can go over any level of government. So if you're interested in running for county commissioner or city council or your soil and water conservation district board, uh, we can tell you what the process is for doing that. Uh, and then at Wednesday, October 25th, uh, it'll start at 645 and we'll be at the Hollywood Library in, in Portland. Um, if anyone signs up for live stream tickets, we will live stream the event. But if no one, uh, no one is there. If no one signs up for it, then we're not gonna we're gonna set it up. But uh, if if you're interested and in, you know you're in Lake County or you're in Wallowa County, uh, in watching one of these, you're more than welcome to sign up, and we will do our best to make the technology work for you. Um, so if you would like to attend one of these, please register uh, at our website, which is www.pdpo.org, um, and then go to the events tab. Uh, we'll also talk about the appointment process for uh, Senate District 19. So if there's anyone in that uh, in that Senate district who would like to uh, learn about the process and what it takes to get appointed, uh, we'd be glad to answer your questions. So is there any final questions on the line, Betsy? John, any final comments? Okay, well, that's our show. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We do have a song. Our, uh, the music today is from the musical of the I Sing. It uh, was written by George Gershwin, and it's generally about uh, presidential elections in Congress. So um, since we're heading to that season, I thought it'd be appropriate for today.
grain and thunder that a million firms go under. I am not concerned with stocks and bonds that I've been burned. I love you and you love me and that's how it will always be and nothing else can ever mean a thing. Who cares what the public chatters? Love's the only thing that matters. Who cares if the score cares to fall in the sea? Who cares what banks fail in Yonkers? Long as you got a kiss that conquers, why should I care? Life is one long jubilee. As long as I care for you, and you care for me. Summer, autumn, winter, spring, baby You're my silver lining You're my sky of blue There's a love light shining Just because of you Of thee I sing, baby You have got that certain thing, baby Shining star and inspiration Worthy of a mighty nation Of the I see 